If you have your Bibles, open to Ephesians chapter 5. If you need a prayer bulletin or sheet like that, please raise your hand and the ushers will get it to you as we continue on in our series on music. And it looks like uh, this week and next week, and then I'll have music wrapped up. And so I have a few other thoughts tonight to give to us about music, answer a few questions, be done in time to have a business meeting tonight, and then next week I'll have the takeaways. What you've all been waiting for will be next week. I'll tell you that right now, all right? Where you're like, well, Pastor, you're going to tell us what song we can listen to. Come back next week, all right? You say, well, that's not very nice. We're already here. Exactly. (laughs) Nothing you can do about now since you're here. You might as well stay anyway. And so if your Bible is open to Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 18, I want to go real quick through uh, the five principles of music that we looked at from God's Word and then answer some questions and then hit a new section tonight as we look at this, uh, this, this really sometimes a hard target to get right, music. Sometimes it's a hard target. Shouldn't be that hard, but it seems like we're all in, it seems, at different places sometimes. You got one up here, gentlemen. Uh, Brother Jimmy, got a, got a teenager up here, if you don't mind. Thank you, sir. Brother Breton up here. And so I'm trying to break it down from God's Word for us and give us some uh, semblance of unity as we follow the Lord and His Spirit. And so let's ask, let's ask the Lord's blessing tonight as we look at this, this topic of music. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for all you've done. Lord, thank you for the chance to be here in church. I pray for your help as I speak that these would, thoughts and ideas and truths would be clear from your word. Lord, that our hearts would be open to your spirit. Lord, guide me and guide uh, the folks as they listen, that all of us would be attentive to what you'd have for us. Lord, may we respond to the way we ought to. In Jesus' name, amen. We look in Ephesians chapter 5, in verse number 18 and 19, uh, where the Bible says this, And be not drunk with wine... Wearing his excess. Don't worry, we'll get to alcohol later on, okay? Not tonight, different, different series in there, or different sermon in this series. Be not drunk with wine, wearing his excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Just a reminder, the first principle we've looked at in music is that corporate music, all right, influences other people, but is directed toward God. So our music as we sing as a church, right, will influence other people. You can bless other people as you sing, but don't ever forget that as we sing, it's directed that way right there. If you think you don't have a good voice, don't forget you're singing to the Lord. Now we may have only certain people sing up here who maybe have a clearer voice, okay, or one with a little more blessing involved, all right, a little more help involved, uh, but all of us are supposed to sing toward the Lord, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, to Him, not to those around us. So it should take away the thought, well, what if someone hears me? Well, Ephesians 5 tells me that's the point, because we, we influence other people, but it's to God. The next principle is this, found in Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, turn there to Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. All right, Colossians chapter 3, going to do a little walkthrough right here. Colossians 3, 15 and 16, where Paul writes, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So remember, that happens, teaching and admonishing one another in these things. And the end of verse tells us where it's directed, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So my music, from my music flows a knowledge of Christ, from the word of Christ that dwells richly in me, in a gratitude, and influences other people. As I sing, it says, I teach and admonish others, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. See, my music affects other people in a worship-style setting like this. Flip over a few more pages to James chapter 5, verse 13. James chapter 5. And, and if you say, well, Pastor, you're flying quick through this, just go back on YouTube and you can find the full explanation on these passages. Just kind of recap. James chapter 5, verse number 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Hmm. So if I'm merry, if I'm happy, not named Mary, if I'm happy, what does James in the Bible say that I'm supposed to do? Sing. Sing. Huh. So when you come to church and sit there like this, 
One of two things. You're not Mary. Or two, you decide not to obey Scripture. Neither one is a good option. Where does my joy come from out of the book of 1 John? From Jesus. That's what 1 John tells us. All right? Joy. Your joy may be full. If my joy is full, I'll be merry. I remember, look at that sermon on a series on 1 John. Joy right there is not just this deep sense of joy. It's deep like a well, Pastor. I'm hiding it from you. It's 200 feet deep. No! It flows from within and comes out. What's inside comes out. If you're merry, sing. Turn over to Psalms chapter 40. Psalm chapter 40. Turn back there. Psalm 40. Those of you who are on an electronic device, just type it right in. It'll pop up real quick then. Psalm 40, verses 1, 2, and 3, where David gives us the idea of a new song. David says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined unto me and heard my cry. Verse 2, he brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. And he hath put a, what's the next two words? New song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God. Many shall see it. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord They'll see a difference as you sing a new song that's different than the old song. Don't forget when I talked about that particular old song, if you look at those first couple of verses, that old song looks to be, in, in context, a song of defeat, a song of despair, a song of discouragement. And David says, out of all that, he, God, put a new song in my mouth. Just remember that, like I told you, the old joke about country music when you play it backwards. You get your wife back, your dog back, your truck back. A song of defeat and despair and discouragement is not a new song. It's an old song. And David says, God put a new song in my mouth, even praise to my God. wonder how many, well, we'll hit that in just a little bit. don't want to get ahead of myself there. Our music should speak of victory and joy, not defeat and despair. And then Exodus chapter 32, last passage to turn to, look at a principle. Exodus chapter 32. It's, of course, the place where Moses and Joshua came down from the mountain. Remember that from last week? Joshua heard that noise. What means this noise in the camp? And Moses says this in Exodus chapter 32. Uh, in verse 18, he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, verse 18, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. Please don't miss this. Music always conveys a message. Music always conveys a message. Good, bad, sad, happy, frightened, triumphant, music always conveys a message. Anyone who typically says otherwise is just a carnal Christian. Because even the unsaved world understands the power of music message. We talked about that as a soundtrack for a movie in a scary scene. They play those low sounds. Dum, 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 dum. Dum, dum, dum. Why do they do that? Because they know that music conveys a message. That's why they do that. It seems to be the carnal Christians who say, hey, it doesn't matter what it sounds like. The words are okay. And music conveys a message. Those are the principles. I'm going to hit a new section tonight if we can. A couple of questions that came in I wanted to look at briefly. One question was this. Can a song or music type be inappropriate at church but still appropriate at home? Can a song or a music type be inappropriate at church but still be appropriate at home. They put that number on the screen. If you want to submit a question, text that number, all right? Uh, if you want to know my, you know, if you want to know what color socks I'm wearing, please don't text those questions in. There's one in every crowd. We got one of those a few weeks ago. Uh, is our Barney the Dinosaur songs appropriate, okay? So we got that one out of the way. But this is a great question. The answer is, I think, relatively simple. We'll look at that some tonight. Appropriate, all right, versus acceptable versus appropriate. But we typically on Sunday morning would not sing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, would we not? We wouldn't because that wouldn't aid us 
in the worship service to worship our Savior, correct? That, that would influence others, but not the right way. That would be not appropriate for church, but you could listen to Twinkle Twinkle Little Star at home, couldn't you? That would be okay? Yes, no? It could be, yeah. Row, row, row your boat. We typically don't sing Sunday nights. Could get a nice little, little round going, though. But it could be appropriate at home. See, there is music that could be not appropriate for church because of the setting. We talked about that. Songs that we wouldn't play uh, on, on Easter, we might play at patriotic service at First Baptist Church. We understand that, how it could be appropriate at the time. And there's times for church that we want to lift our hearts this way. And some of those songs are just silly little, little nursery rhymes. All right? And they may be okay at home, but not for a church. So this is a good, good question. Here's another good question. Can a song be okay in one arrangement? Arrangement is a, where a song is, is uh, turned a certain way. I'll give you an example in just a minute, but not in another. Well, the answer is absolutely. I'll break it down for you real easy. I have not heard more than maybe I, just a few notes of this particular artist, and his name was uh, Elvis Presley. Anybody ever heard the name before, Elvis Presley? Some of you probably more than others. Apparently, I am told he sang the song Amazing Grace. We've sung Amazing Grace here at church. I don't know that much about Elvis Presley. I was not born when he was alive. I did not listen to Elvis Presley. Some of you could, could give me the information on him, and please do not after church. I do not care about him. <laughs> but we could probably categorically say that, uh, that Elvis Presley singing Amazing Grace would not be good for a church service, right? Same song, different arrangement. So absolutely, a song that might be acceptable in, in a certain form in another form, by, in a different way, could be unacceptable. Say, absolutely. Absolutely. Good question. Here's one. What course of action should be taken when you are addressed by someone that thinks something is okay when it isn't biblically? Now, this is a, a, a deeper question. Right? This, this implies that, that now I read how the Bible says this and someone else is interpreting the Bible incorrectly. Well, how do we navigate that? And this, I think, answer would go not just for music, but for a number of things that, that people would possibly disagree on. I think of Proverbs 26, verses 4 and 5. Some excellent truth in this situation. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. And answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Would we not, first of all, have to pray for wisdom, as James 1 tells us, to know what kind of issue and question are we facing here? Could there not be the time when someone comes and asks a question, well, what do you think about this? Did Adam have a belly button? That would we not say that I wouldn't want to answer that because I don't want to be like unto him? Right answer, not a fool, according to his folly. And it's not a topic for conversation. It's, and we're not going to get anywhere. He's not really asking, and, and I doubt if I even had a thought on that, and I don't, but if I even had a thought on it, that it would change anyone's mind or anyone's life. If I said, no, he didn't. That's it, Pastor. I'm serving God forever now. Yes, he did. That's it. I'm not working. I'm quitting my bus route. What? There'd be no connection there. But I tell you, I have had some questions from teenagers years ago about music. They came to the office like this. Okay, Pastor Howell, Pastor J.D., what's wrong with this music? A real humble, open spirit, you can tell, right? Right? Answer, not a fool, but I need the wisdom because sometimes I don't know in my wisdom, right? Like all the time, we don't know in our wisdom. All right, what's going on here? So I want God's wisdom. I want a wisdom in knowing, wisdom in speaking, wisdom when to be quiet. I'd say, number one, ask for wisdom. Number two, use the truth. This question was, what happens when they disagree with you on something that's biblical? Well, use the Bible. Use the Bible. All right, so they can argue with the Bible. What do a lot of, unfortunately, not a lot, but some people do, they say, well, that's not what it means to me. Oh, okay. I didn't realize you're the authority on the interpretation of God's Word, all right? Let's look at it again. What about this passage and this passage and this passage? Well, I just think it's okay. Well, now we understand where we're at. You're going to ignore what the Bible says. So I want to use the truth. The truth is what changes hearts. The truth is what changes lives, all right? Not my argumentation. 
It's God's Word. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. And number three, and I think probably the hardest part of this particular answer is have patience for the Lord to do His work. All right, so does everyone grow at the same pace in real life? No. I got kids, and they grow like this, right? And one day, like, boom, the other day, they're like, you didn't grow for a long time. And in the, in the school class, you'll see the same grade and, and different little heights, right? And spiritually, people grow at different speeds, okay? H- have I always grown as fast as God has wanted me to grow? No. Have you? No. Absolutely not. So we don't have patience for the Lord to do His work. Is everyone where I want them to be? Yeah, trick question. It's not up to me. Am I where God wants me to be? So have patience for someone to grow. The last question I'll look at tonight, another excellent question. What is the best way to get outside of the desire for bad music? What is the best way to get outside of the desire for bad music? I think that's an excellent question. If you come uh, saved or unsaved, there's the real possibility that you have some music in your background, and you know when I identify some ideas like how music gets into your soul, how you can walk into a place and hear just a couple of sounds, and it'll take you to a place that you don't want to go back to, maybe the first time you heard that song or, or an emotion attached to it. Music, for whatever reason, gets into our soul, it seems like. And unfortunately, I've heard from many of you the last few weeks that you've said, you know, Pastor, when you said that, I, I still remember the first time I heard this, this particular bad song or, or this. And, and, and listen, I, the same, I, I can remember songs I heard walking into a mall. I could hear one or two chords, and I know the song. How do you get over outside of the desire for bad music? Well, it's not polite to ask a question or answer a question with a question, but I think it's fitting here. How do you stop eating food that's bad for you? How? Well, you stop. Right? That's right. You stop. I shouldn't eat the donut. Oh, I shouldn't eat that donut. I'm not going to feel good later on. Oh, man. Well, number one, you, you stop eating it. All right, well, that seems simple, Pastor. Yeah, but a lot harder to do. A lot harder to do when you work in a donut shop. So we live in this world, don't we? A lot harder to do when you work in a donut shop. You stop eating. Number two, you replace the unhealthy with the healthy. I'll give me a verse at the end of this, all right? You replace the unhealthy with the healthy. All right? And so anyone who's ever been on a diet knows how this kind of concept works. Instead of choosing more macaroni and cheese, you choose broccoli. And here's the, the, here's the, honest, the, the, here, here's the honest statement about this. When you first eat broccoli, it's probably not as good as mac and cheese. Can I just, can I just throw this out there so we don't pretend that it's something that's not? When you first, I mean, what tastes better? A donut, mac and cheese, or broccoli. Now, if you say broccoli, it's because you've been eating broccoli. I've had kids, my kids now, I don't know why, i got one kid in particular who forever has enjoyed broccoli more than french fries. All right, this is my little son, James. You're weird, Bradley, okay, you're weird. <laughs> oh, is that Spencer? Both of you are weird. No. <laughs> We're at the restaurant recently, and James says to the, to the waitress, can I, have, can I have with my hamburger broccoli instead of French fries? She looks at me, and she goes, that'll be an upcharge. <laughs> this is the problem of America. <laughs> All right, you want to make America great? Change the price of broccoli in America. <laughs> Who does that? My kid. Uh, the salad. But you have to replace it with something. You cannot go to a void. If you say, you know what, I'm going to eat no more donuts. In fact, I will eat nothing else in my life. All right, you will die. You will die. It will not be sustainable, I promise you. So replace the unhealthy music with healthy music, with good music. Where do I find it, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. we got a bookstore back there on the way out. Grab some of those CDs. All right, I will give you my word. Those are good music CDs in that place. Give you my word. You can buy any of those, listen to them. They say, well, Pastor, this doesn't, this doesn't touch me as like this old bad music I had. You're right. 
You're right, because I was appealing to a few things that we don't want to appeal, appeal to. But I promise you, stick with it. And then lastly, avoid times and places that put you in a place of temptation. This is common sense. If you're on a diet, the place you don't want to go is Old Country Buffet or Golden Corral or Brazilian Steakhouse. All right? Because this is maybe tempt you above that you're able. All right? There are still to this day because of music stores that I will not walk into. Because my spirit just, it's like, it's, it's just an overwhelming, depressing, it just weighs me down. I don't, I don't like it. So I avoid that store. You say, well, well, what are you going to do? What if you need something? Listen, we live in 2020. There's a whole bunch of stores. And if I didn't want to go to a store, I can use Amazon. Or I can get what I need. Here's the verses for you. Romans 13, 13 and 14. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. Some very specific habits, patterns, ideas, and spirit, a spirit to put off. Let us not do these things, not in rioting and drunkenness and chambering and wantonness, strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. If we're honest, if we struggling with wrong music, are we struggling because the Holy Spirit is battling for that music or battling against that music? He's battling against that music. And so Paul in Romans says, don't make provision for the flesh and the lusts and those things. I want to look tonight, if you would turn to 1 Corinthians as we go on just a few minutes in 1 Corinthians. Oh, you've done time for business meeting. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. See, we've looked at some principles, and if you remember back to our big concept for this, for this idea, we have the principles from God's Word, now we have the convictions. An integral part of the music discussion is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And don't for, forget 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, where Paul writes, but the natural man, all right, the one that we all have inside of us, the natural man, all right, the one that's going to fight against the Holy Spirit, the one that's going to be our to our own lusts and our own flesh, it receives not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The Holy Spirit plays a vital role, a non-replaceable role, when we talk about music. I last week talked about some of the, the forms of music and the idea behind music and gave quite a bit of terms, all right? A lot of you just went right over your head, which is fine, all right? I have been around music a long time. I am not an expert, all right? I probably know more than some, uh, maybe in this room, and know a lot less than others, okay? But I know enough to be dangerous, and I, I know enough to be able to explain certain things, but you understand that there can be a time when you hear a song, and I can hear the same song, and right here in my spirit, all right, I call my heart, but my spirit inside of me, it's, I'm not okay with it. I'm not okay with it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not pleased, and, 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 I'm, and I'm grieved by it on the inside. Has anyone ever experienced this with music before? You, you hear something, anybody ever, you might just raise their hand, ever, like, it's just like, I'm not okay with this. Now, the reality is, I, maybe with my training, would maybe be able to explain a little better why the things that would irritate me about this particular music. Sometimes it's a style, and sometimes a singer with a, a particular microphone technique will produce a style that's, that's not pleasing, and, and, and it's and some things you can do with a microphone, like, that's not good, or per perhaps an instrument is overtaking the song, and I could hear that instrument, or there should be some chords that maybe I know that. But the, the bottom line is this, you don't have to know all that. Right here, you have the Holy Spirit. And He can minister to you and help you spiritually discern what is right and what is wrong. Now, there are some things, all right, as we look at Bible principles, that I don't need, in a sense, the Holy Spirit for. You say, well, pastor, I don't want to sing out loud at church, right? right? But the Bible tells me to, right? So I don't need the Holy Spirit to move me to do that. God's already told me that through His Word. He's already explained it really, really clearly. All right, so whether I feel it or not, I got to do it. But the Holy Spirit works inside of these things. And I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit, I don't want 
music that turns me away from God. I don't want my mind to, I want my mind to be filled with good, moral, and beautiful thoughts. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, are, are true whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. So Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 tells me that there are some things that I'm as a Christian supposed to think on. You know that your music can take your mind off of thinking on things that would line up with Philippians 4, verse 8. And if it does, that music is in violation of Scripture. And any music that is in violation of Scripture ought to be rejected. Ought to be rejected. I will give you a foolish, silly example. This song is not wrong, I would say, because of its beat, because of its rhythm, because of its chord structure. But because it will take your mind off thinking of things that are true, honest, and just, a good report, and virtue, and praise. Years ago, there was a song for a kids' program called, This is a Song That Doesn't End or Never Ends. That never ends. Some of you know this. Yes, it goes on and on, my friends. Some people, yeah, I'll be singing the rest of the night now, won't you? That's a silly song. But that song can get stuck in your head, can it not? Right? Well, if it's stuck in my head playing over and over on repeat, what is my mind not filled with? Let me answer the question for you. These things. That's what Paul says in Philippians. These things. So one test with the Holy Spirit's help to say, listen, does this music I'm listening to take my mind off of these things? If it does take my mind off of these things and I continue in that I have rejected Scripture, rejected leading the Holy Spirit, and I am now in violation of God's Word. You say, wow, Pastor, does that mean I should only listen to Christian music? Perhaps. Perhaps for some of you. Perhaps. Because you can't control your mind. And you know music plays... Everything I do, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, ought to turn me toward God, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Don't forget, if we're talking about music on a table again, that, that I would say music, there's a table out there. Music is either on the table or off the table. All right, acceptable versus appropriate. There is some music that has no place on the table of a Christian. For the lyrics, for the direction, because of a message that it sends, because of its distractions to the things of God, comes off the table. But on that table, there's a, a lot of songs that could be acceptable but aren't appropriate. Sometimes not appropriate because of timing, and sometimes not appropriate because of occasion. And remember that, that one, one thing that we're, one idea that we use in this is identification. Now, let me just kind of explain something I do here at First Baptist Church as I look at what songs we do. It's the idea of identification. I don't, I don't desire for a particular song when it's sung here at church to be identified by a particular singer. Now, not a church singer, but by maybe whoever, may, whoever sang the song. Right? You realize we have not written all of our own music here at First Baptist Church, right? You realize that? I know you think we write everything, but we don't. All right? We get it from other sources. And it's a, it's a blessing. And many of you have commented on the, the, the privilege of the music we have here at First Baptist Church, and I wholeheartedly agree. Our, our music department does a phenomenal job, led by Pastor Dylan, our pianist, you know, um, Mrs. Moore and Miss Robinson and Miss Evans, and all of them do a great job. Organists, I mean, just everybody, orchestra, all of it, choir, and the singer is great. We're grabbing different songs. You know, some songs have sometimes been sung by someone that we would not completely agree with on everything that they've ever done in their whole life at every moment you say uh oh so I have a couple of choices to make one um, identification I want to know that this particular song we're going to use and maybe sometimes we use some newer songs even as well I don't want everyone to think oh I know who sings that song years ago in churches there was a song and I remember the church that I was in that, that when this song hit the mainstream and the song was titled, People Need the Lord. 
The person who really sang it was a, an artist. I believe he was, I don't remember what he was exactly, but his beliefs were not Baptists. People up in arms. And probably in one sense rightfully should be when you're thinking about a particular person singing instead of what the song says. We've sung a song here, and the song is, My, uh, my, my Chains Are Gone. I've been set free. And we sang it for the communion service. Remember at the end of that, we sang that song. Many of you said, well, that was, that was great, Pastor. I'll enjoy singing that. Some people are um, not here, but I have a pastor friend who says, you know what? I can't sing that song because I know who sang it. I said, okay. But I know our church doesn't think about that. Identification. All right, I want us to identify something here, but by who sang it? By the sound. Remember, music sends a message. And so I don't want the sound to give an uncertain sound. I want the sound to be what would be found uh, uh, of expected at a church. You know that people have an expectation of Christians? If you don't believe this, all right, hire somebody at your house, a contractor who's a Christian, and have them not finish the job and watch what you say about that. This is what I have heard over and over. I expected better because he or she was a... You have expectations. You expect something, right? Oh, I didn't think a Christian would say that. Expectation. You know, they have expectation for music as well. A sound. Identification. You want to be able to identify when people come in that this is church. Identify a church when they walk in the doors. Not just off the building or the pews, but by the sound that they hear. You know that we can identify differently. We can identify as a carnival. And what would carnival music sound like? You think that little, uh, that little uh, music, right? That little like playing, those little things up there? But we're not a carnival, are we? No. We can identify as a circus, but we're not a circus. We can identify as a concert. But we're not a concert. We could identify as never seen the grace of God in our life. But we have. Identification. When I look at what's acceptable versus appropriate, identification plays a key role. You see, I want to have these things be, as 1 Corinthians says, spiritually discerned. The Holy Spirit working in my heart and in your heart, seeking God's wisdom through His principles, saying, Lord, speak to me. Tell me. If you do that, you'll find out that He will. There may be some I'm listening to off my, off my phone, and I'll be like, I don't like that. A few weeks ago, I, I made a terrible decision in my life. I wanted to, to see something on my phone. The decision was this. I was at the gym. I was listening to some music I listened to, and I typed in Christian exercise music. I was curious. I got about three seconds in. Did not recognize the first song that popped up. I said, whoa. I stopped that real quick. I wouldn't have known it was Christian. Except that what was returned to me was Christian exercise music. It is like no Christian music I have ever heard before from a Christian. It is like no music I've ever heard at a church before. And it was no music that I want in my life. I shut that thing off and said, this is crazy. Then I started just scanning through, scanning through the titles of, of these songs. Now I was intrigued. And even looking at the titles, it was just, well, oh, this is crazy. This is nuts. And this is Christian? You gotta want spiritual discernment from the Holy Spirit. So you know what? I gotta shut that off. Why? Well, maybe I know why. But bottom line is the Holy Spirit touches me. See, the principle of music. Let the Holy Spirit give you convictions through His Word. Lord, thank You for loving us. Thank You for what You've done. Lord, I ask You to help us as we finish up next week on music to look at Your Word and listen to Your Holy Spirit. Lord, apply those truths. Maybe help to people. Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.